Hello everyone and welcome to Box Office Receipts. I'm your host Tyler Callahan and we got a mix of things going on. The box office was kind of quiet this week, but there were new films announced, release date news, and streaming updates. Let's start with the weekend top five. So it was a quiet weekend domestically and with that bullet train stayed in first place with 13.4 million for a total of 54.4 million. In second place is League of Super Pets with 7.1 million for a total of 58.3 million. Moving back up to third place thanks to an expansion is Top Gun Maverick with 7.1 million for a total of 673.8 million. It gained 421 theaters over the weekend and was only $200,000 behind Super Pets to take second place. Fourth place was Thor Love and Thunder with 5.31 million for a total of 325.3 million. And fifth place was Nope with 5.3 million for a total of 107.5 million. Also, A24's newest film, Bodies, 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 expanded to a wide release this weekend, but came in eighth place with 3.2 million for a total of 3.5 million. I should note it's at a bare minimum of a wide release, currently in 1,200. In 85 theaters. So for Sony, Bullet Train's 55% drop from its opening weekend is not too bad, and better than some of the big blockbuster films that drop over 60% in comparison. It's also now slightly past the halfway mark to 100 million, which should still be the goal for the film to make. It's going to be close, but I think there's a small chance it'll make it, likely in the middle or toward the end of September. One film that will not be making 100 million domestic is League of Super Pets, which will likely top out around 75 million, which for a 90 million dollar film isn't great. Also for A24, I think they messed up a bit with their release of Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. They were doing a limited release last week and then expanded into a small wide release this past weekend, like this was an Oscar film. Uh, I feel like when you got a film like this, one aiming at a young adult crowd, you'd want to just hit the wide release as soon as you can. In China, Moon Man continues to dominate for the third weekend in a row. It came in again in first place with 32.1 million for a total of 361 million. In second place was The Fallen Bridge, a new drama film which opened to 18 million. Drop in the third place was Warriors of Future, making 11.8 million for a total of 52.2 million. Fourth place was Goodbye Monster, which opened to 2.8 million. And in fifth place was Butcher Hunter which made 1.6 million in its debut. It's been a while, but the top five in China are all Chinese films with Jurassic World Dominion ending a tron. Right now, Moon Man is carrying the load as the biggest blockbuster since February for the Chinese box office, but with more studios releasing films, there should be other bigger ones soon. And then for Hollywood films, Minions The Rise of Gru opens next weekend. Looking at worldwide numbers, Bullet Train made another 17 million, for a total of 114.5 million. League of Super Pets made 7.7 million for a worldwide total of 109.7 million. Again, not great for the film. Nope is starting to be released internationally and made 6.3 million for a total of 113.9 million. Also from Universal, the Idris Elba thriller Beast opened in a few international markets this past weekend ahead of its domestic release and made 4.7 million. Minions The Rise of Gru is at 790.4 million after making 10.8 million over the weekend and Top Gun Maverick is now at 1.378 billion. Before we move on from the numbers, it should be noted that after this weekend, Universal has passed $3 billion worldwide at the box office for 2022, the first studio to hit the milestone since 2019. I'd say that is good news for competition and a sign that the box office is still working its way back to normal. While Jurassic World Dominion and Minions The Rise of Gru account for just over half of that $3 billion, the rest was made by its smaller films like, like Nope, The Bad Guys, Northmen, Ambulance, and others. Compared to other studios this year, I will say Universal has had a diverse lineup of films releasing in theaters. Let's start off the news in Hollywood with one of the bigger stories this week, and that is Cineworld might be getting ready to file for bankruptcy. The Wall Street Journal first reported that while they are preparing to file for bankruptcy in the United States, and in the UK, filed for insolvency proceedings. With all the speculation on if they would do it, Cineworld came out this week and said that they are considering it, but have not filed anything yet 
and as of now, all of its theaters would remain open. It should be noted that they are reported to be filing for a Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which means it's a way for them to sell off assets, reorganize the company, and pay off debt. If they do it right, they can survive just fine. Chapter 7 bankruptcy is when the company is screwed and they would be sold off for parts. Also, in case you didn't know, Cineworld not only owns Cineworld Cinemas in the UK and Ireland, but also owns Regal in the United States, so they are pretty big. Now, as of why they would be filing for bankruptcy, well, while people have returned to theaters as of July 2021, they have $4.8 billion in debt they need to pay off. On top of that, they did not get the influx of capital like, like AMC got when that stock became a meme stock and shot up for a long period of time. When that happened, AMC was able to reorganize and pay off some of its debts to come out of it more stable. Cineworld does not have that luxury. Overall, I think think though they, they will be fine. There might be a few theaters that are sold off to competitors, but with theaters staying open and they are bringing in revenue, I don't see how they would not be able to reorganize and start to pay off their debt. We have a release date change with a film being moved up. Disney and 20th Century is moving up Amsterdam from November and will now come out October 7th. As of now, it will go up against Sony's family film Lyle Lyle Crocodile. I think this is a smart move because if Black Panther Wakanda Forever does big numbers, that will dominate into December, and then Avatar takes over. So for Disney, Amsterdam can have some of October to itself, as Black Adam doesn't come out toward the end of the month. Let's talk about Warner Brothers as they have some new films in the work. A few months ago, I talked about the next Ocean film that they were working on, starring Margot Robbie, and set in the 60s. Well, the latest news is that her co-lead might be Ryan Gosling. Currently, he's not signed on just yet, with reports saying he is just in talks. If he wants to join, this would be the second movie he works on with both Margot Robbie and with Warner Brothers as the studio. Obviously the other one being Barbie. Other details right now is that the script is being written by Carrie Solomon and that the film has not been greenlit yet for production just yet. And it's just still being developed. Having the leads for the film be Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling would definitely bring the star power would be since an Ocean's film, it would be a solid heist film. Definitely with a good script, it can be a good time, so... I'm looking forward to it. The film is also developing a new film that Deadline is exclusively reporting on. The film is an assassin film called Shibumi, with it being directed by John Wick director Chad Stasinski and written by Matthew Orton. It's based off of a late 70s novel where it follows a well-versed assassin. Currently, there is no one attached yet to star in the film or when they expect to start production. I'm a sucker for these kinds of films, and Stasinski has been doing great uh, directing the John Wick film so far, so it's not a bad choice. As long as it's a solid cast and great action, I'm all for it. Another film the studio is starting to put together is called Wise Guys, and will star Robert De Niro and be directed by Barry Levinson. In a shock, the film is about two Italian-Americans running their own mafias, and one tries to assassinate the other. What's odd about this, though, is it's being reported that De Niro will play both lead roles, so I'm not sure if the two main characters are supposed to be twins, or if they're just going to do a lot of makeup. But yeah, surprise, surprise, De Niro and a mobster movie. What a shock. Now, apparently part of the sell for this film is that they're going to build it as De Niro's last mobster film. That's not a bad way to sell it and get people interested, but it still needs to be a good film. And please, please, no de-aging. I think we learned that from the Irishman. We got an update on the situation with Ezra Miller from Miller himself. He released a statement this week week saying, quote, having gone through a time of intense crisis, I now understand I am suffering complex mental health issues and have begun ongoing treatment. I want to apologize to everyone that I have alarmed and upset with my past behavior, and I'm committed to doing the necessary work to get back to a healthy, safe, and productive stage in my life, end quote. So it sounds like the work Warner Brothers and Miller's agency, CAA, have actually gotten him to understand how serious his situation really is. Now, we don't know what really went on in those conversations, but assuming his statement is truthful, I'm glad he is now looking to get treatment and get the help he needs. Still, based on what he has done so far, I don't think the charges he faces in Vermont should be dropped just yet, and hopefully he makes his court appearance next month. The last story we got for Warner Brothers is actually a bit of a shocking one, and Deadline has the exclusive on it. They are reporting that MGM and Warner Brothers have reached an agreement where Warner Brothers will distribute MGM films internationally, including China. The terms of the deal is for three years, with the option to add another two. During that time, Warner Brothers will handle distribution for MGM films, 
internationally with both studios in charge of handling marketing. After the film's theatrical release, Warner Brothers will also be in charge of both physical media for them, so Blu-rays and DVDs. Regarding physical media, that is worldwide, so it'll also include the United States as well. Regarding James Bond films, well that's a bit different. Based on MGM's old deal with Universal, that studio still has the rights to distribute the next one, Bond 26, whenever it comes out. Bond 27 and forward, those ones will be handled by Warner Brothers. As for the deal itself, I'm not too surprised as what we've seen over the past few months, Amazon right now seems to be clearing the slate of MGM films that they were already made, and it seems like the less they have to handle for theatrical distribution, the better. Now with MGM, they just have to focus on the domestic market and let Warner Brothers handle international. What I was surprised with was they went with Warner Brothers and not renewed their deal with Universal. But I think the reason for that is who was involved. In Deadline's article, they mentioned how the co-CEOs of Warner Brothers, Michael DeLuca and Pamela Amdi, worked on the deal with uh, MGM's CEO up. You know, the co-CEOs of MGM up until a few months ago. So yeah, I think part of the reason MGM and Warner Brothers got together is the executives knew each other and have worked with each other. Now, it's not like this deal is bad for Warner Brothers. Uh, Z- Zaslav should be happy with this as they now get to distribute more films that they don't have to produce themselves. If the films take off, they get a nice cut. Now, if MGM releases bomb after bomb, then you could lose some cash. But, but since they are now pushing to cut as much debt as possible, this is a good deal for them. In a very shocking new movie announcement, Lionsgate announced that they are working on a new Saw film. Again, some shocking film announcements this week, let me tell you. Uh, It'll be directed by Kevin Grudet, who directed Saw 6 and the final chapter, and it'll come out October 27th, 2023. I don't care about this franchise, so for personal thoughts, I don't have much to say. But for Lionsgate, this makes sense. Horror films are cheap to make, can make easy money. And they don't have a lot of franchises, so beggars can't be choosers. Also in Lionsgate news, they have casted their antagonist for the Hunger Games prequel. Uh, Viola Davis has joined the Battle of Songbirds and Snakes, where she will play the role of head game master. She's a great actress, so she'll probably be a solid villain for the movie. Still not excited to see it, but now it has some star power in it, so uh, we'll see. Deadline has the exclusive on this next story, and that is Sony is adapting another PlayStation game for the big screen. With PlayStation Productions, they are now working on adapting Days Gone into a film, the biker zombie game that came out a few years ago. Right now, details are a bit light, but it looks like Sam Hogan is looking to sign on for the lead role of Deacon St. John, and the script is being written by Sheldon Turner. I haven't played the game yet, but I know enough about the premise to know that this could adapt well to a film. Biker trying to live in a zombie apocalypse? Yeah, that could work. I also think with the lack of zombie films the past few years, when this eventually comes out, people might be interested enough to go out and watch. Like, if this came out a few years ago, timing would have been terrible, with zombie saturation and the audience kind of getting sick of it. For Disney, they're working on turning another theme park right into a film. Deadline has the exclusive on this, and the ride that they have selected is Big Thunder Mountain. Not much is known about the film, but for directing, it looks like the directors of Half of Hawkeye might do it. They are currently in negotiations to direct, uh, I do think they will get contracts done because what Deadline is reporting is that they came up with the idea for the film and pitched it to Disney executives who liked the idea of it. So at least for this ride turning into a film, it wasn't them getting any director to film it. The idea was presented to them. As for if it could work, I don't see why not. I said it before and I'll say it again. If the 2010s were them remaking their animated films to live action, the 2020s are them turning their rides into films. In film rights news, the Lord of the Rings rights have been sold off to Embracer. You might have heard Embracer as the conglomerate buying up a bunch of mid-tier game franchises and studios. But they came out of the blue this week acquiring Middle Earth Enterprises. So basically, how this worked over the past 20 years is that Middle Earth Enterprises was a holding company for the rights to the franchise. This included Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, and allows anyone with these rights to make films, video games, merchandise, among other uses of it. This was separate from the Tolkien estate and was run by a separate, smaller company. That company has now sold the rights to Embracer. What does that mean for Warner Brothers? It's unclear right now. Currently, they only have the Lord of the Rings animated film production. But after that, uh, nothing's lined up. 
Now, Warner Brothers can always get the rights back to make more games and films, but it will now be making a deal with Embracer to get those rights. As for Embracer, I'm not sure why they bought the rights. I can understand, as they are mostly a video game conglomerate, they might want to greatly expand a franchise in that format. But for films? I have a hard time seeing them make a deal with Warner Brothers or any other studio, for that matter, to remake the Lord of the Rings films. The backlash on that would be insane. Uh, also, it should be noted that due to a loophole in the original contract for the rights, it does not include the right to make a TV series within the franchise longer than 8 episodes. This allowed Amazon to make a deal with the Tolkien estate directly for their series The Ring of Power, so they're not affected by this. Finally, we got some news in China. If you have access to the Chinese stock market, you can now invest in Bona Film Group. They are one of the production companies in the film industry in the country and have produced some big films, including The Battle of Lake Changjin and Operation Red Sea. They also used to be on the Nasdaq stock market, but went private back in 2016 and have remained that way until now. Right now, they trade on the Shenzhen stock market. start off VOD Premium with a report from Nielsen showing that domestically for the first time ever, more people are watching content via streaming than on cable. For July 2022, streaming accounted for 34.8% of TV watching, while cable was in second with 34.4%. Streaming only beat out cable by a hair, but compared to July 2021, streaming has made up a lot of ground. Last year, streaming was only 23%, while cable was around 43%. This is not too surprising, as really it's expected for streaming to only grow past cable for multiple reasons. One, the biggest shows on TV can all be watched on streaming, and even ones on HBO, which is cable, can just be uh, watched on HBO Max. Second is people every quarter keep cutting cable. This has been happening for years, and there is no sign of it stopping. And the last reason is a big one, and will take a few more years, but sports is a big reason for cable watching. And more and more sports are becoming available to stream. But just because the tides are finally changing, or at least in America, it will easily be another decade or more before cable is for the select few who can't or refuse to cut it. A small update from Peacock where they are bringing out the big guns for their service. Sorry, I should say dinosaurs. Uh, Jurassic World Dominion will be available to stream on Peacock on September 2nd and will include both the theatrical and extended version of the film. The extended version includes an extra 14 minutes and an alternative opening. The service will also be getting back the rights to stream the original Jurassic Park trilogy, and those will be available September 1st. So why September 2nd? Well, I think they wanted to drop it on the service in part for Labor Day weekend, but I also think they wanted to show off something spicy to compete with everyone else. Right now Disney Plus is airing She-Hulk, HBO Max is about to show House of the Dragons, and Amazon's getting ready for Rings of Power. For Peacock, this film is the closest they are getting to that level of entertainment. I think they might get a few sign-ups for it, but this will not be a big boon in new subs. Also, I find it weird that they can't stream Jurassic World or Fallen Kingdom yet. I did a quick check, and they are not available to stream anywhere. Only buy or rent on VOD. Wonder what happened to those rights. Going over to Apple TV+, Plus, Deadline has the exclusive on a new film they're working on. The film is called The Family Man, and will be a co-production between Apple Original Films and Skydance Media. It's an action comedy film where a father has to take his family on the run with his past catching up to him. So far, Mark Wahlberg has been cast as the lead role of the father, and Simon Salon Jones will, will direct. The two actually recently worked together on a different film called Arthur the King for Entertainment One. That film isn't out yet, it's in uh, post production. As for the family man, eh. For me, Mark Wahlberg is very eh. Like, sometimes he can be really good, but a lot of times he's very meh. I'm going to have to see a trailer for this before I get all at all excited. And in another film between Apple and Skydance Media, The Greatest Beer Run got its first trailer and poster released this week. It stars Zac Efron, Russell Crowe, and Bill Murray, and is adapted from a book based on a true story where an American sneaks into Vietnam during the Vietnam War to see his friends. The film will premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival September 13th, and then on Apple TV Plus and select theaters on September 30th. Not much from Netflix this week, just that they have started their promotion for Enolia Holmes 2. No trailer just yet, but we got a poster, some stills, and a release date, which we learned will come out November 4th. I haven't seen the first one, but have heard it's pretty good. Nothing amazing, but considering some of the film's Netflix releases, it was on the better side. 
hopefully for fans at first, the sequel is just as good. For HBO Max, the big news this week was the layoffs have happened. Leading up to the quarterly earnings report, there were rumors of possibly massive layoffs, but they did not come. Well, some of them came this week. In total, about 70 people were laid off. In total, about 70 people were laid off, with most of them being from HBO Max. The layoffs that occurred is not much of a surprise, as the plan has been to move a lot of uh, what HBO Max is doing to HBO proper, as HBO Max and Discovery Plus start to merge. Hopefully, the ones who were let go land on their feet as soon as possible. We finish up with Paramount with a few stories. The first is Paramount Plus will now be included in Walmart Plus at no extra charge. The two companies agreed to a partnership for this and announced it via press release this week. Specifically, the ad-supported tier will be included in Walmart membership. For Walmart Plus members, the Paramount Plus perk should be available within the next few weeks. It is not clear right now if Walmart Plus members will be able to pay the difference and upgrade to the ad-free plan. I think for both companies, this is a great partnership. But with this being a Hollywood podcast, I'm going to focus on Paramount. For them, this is a great way to get a few million new subscribers in a short amount of time. Deadline reports that they have about 16 million Walmart Plus subscribers. So even if 3 million sign up from Walmart and use Paramount Plus, that's going to look good on the next earnings report. As long as Walmart is paying them well and Paramount has not taken on too much of a loss per subscriber from Walmart Plus, this is a win for them. Also, they get some free advertising because now when Walmart advertises Walmart Plus, they should be mentioning, oh hey, look, it also includes Paramount Plus as well. Next is a spin-off film that looks like it could be a big dud. Deadline has the exclusive on this, and that is the studio is looking to make a spin-off film, a Ferris Bueller Days Off, except it's focused on the valet guys who took the Ferrari on a joyride. Right now it's called Sam and Victor's Day Off, and it's being written by Bill Posley. Now this could be a good film in its own right. It could. But this is going to be one of those cases where it's a spin-off of a classic film will not help it in any way. If this is going to be good, it's going to be in a script and the two lead actors they get. If they can make the comedy work, then it could be a good film on its own right. But right now, I feel the odds are stacked a bit against them. Finally, what I would say is the biggest news for Paramount this week is that they are able to lock in a contract extension with UEFA. They have agreed to a new contract with the soccer organization for $1.5 billion over six years, bringing their contract to 2030. While there will be a steep increase in annual pay to UEFA, from 100 million per year for now to 250 million per year when the extension kicks in in 2024 does guarantee Paramount having some of the biggest soccer matches for the rest of the decade. While this includes the Europa League, it includes the coveted and huge Champions League. And with a feeling like soccer is getting bigger domestically every year, if people keep subscribing to Paramount Plus to watch the games, this could pay for itself over time. But yeah, it was very important for Paramount to lock this up as other streamers focus on sports content. They can't let it go if they want to keep growing. That'll be it for this episode of Box Office Receipt. Question for the episode, is any of the new films in development exciting or do they not interest you? Let me know on Facebook. Link to the page is in the show notes. Thank you for listening and see you next time.